On July 19, 1920, V.I. Lenin, leader of the Russian Revolution of 1917, made a presentation to the Second Congress of the Third Communist International that reflected the impact the Garvey movement and other struggles for national liberation were having on the consciousness of Europeans who had previously disregarded our significance. Faced with the growing clamor of, and actions of the world's peoples to escape imperialist domination, Lenin was forced to conclude, quote, world imperialism shall fall when the revolutionary onslaught of the exploited and oppressed workers in each country, overcoming resistance from petty bourgeois elements and the influence of the small upper crust of labor aristocrats, merges with the revolutionary onslaught of hundreds of millions of people who have hitherto stood beyond the pale of history and have been regarded merely as the object of history. So this is what's going to take imperialism out. And that's something that, that, that the North American and, and other European leftists will have to uh, understand. I'm going to quote you this, uh, a couple of things from, um, from Marx and then uh, I will entertain another kind of discussion by you. Karl Marx sought to uh, explain capitalism and its advent in a seminal work entitled Capital, published in 1867. Though Marx's Capital was undoubtedly one of the most influential works of the past century, it marginalized its most important points. Found buried inside of Marx's works are key observations that give scientific credibility to the assumptions made, held by Africans and others who have been the ultimate victims of capitalism and whose emancipation would determine the future of capitalism. Establishing the origin of capitalism and its dynamics within the European world as having their basis in the forcible expropriation of massive amounts of value from Africans and others, Marx wrote in part eight of capital, quote, we have seen how money is changed into capital, how through capital surplus value is made, and from surplus value more capital, but the accumulation of capital presupposes surplus value. Surplus value presupposes capitalistic production. Capitalistic production presupposes the existence of considerable masses of capital and labor power in the hands of producers of commodities. The whole movement, therefore, seems to turn in a vicious circle, out of which we can only get by supposing a primitive accumulation preceding capitalistic accumulation, an accumulation not the result of the capitalist mode of production, but its starting point. An accumulation of capital, not the result of the capitalistic mode of production, but its starting point. He goes on to say, this a prim primitive accumulation, this, this primitive accumulation plays in political economy about the same part as original sin in theology. This primitive accumulation plays in political economy about the same part as original sin in theology. He says further, the discovery of gold and silver in America, the extirpation, enslavement, and entombment in mines of the aboriginal population, the beginning of the conquest and looting of the East Indies, the turning of Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins, signalized the rosy dawn of the era of capitalistic production. These idyllic proceedings are the chief momenta of primitive accumulation. While the cotton industry introduced child slavery in England, it gave in the United States a stimulus to the transformation of the earlier, more or less patriarchal slavery into a system of commercial exploitation. In fact, the veiled slavery of the wage worker in Europe needed for its pedestal slavery pure and simple in the new world. Again, he says, in a book called The Poverty of Philosophy, direct slavery is as much the pivot of bourgeois industry as machinery, credits, etc. Without slavery, you have no cotton. Without cotton, you have no modern industry. It is slavery that gave the colonies their value. It is the colonies that created world trade. And it is world trade that is the precondition of large-scale industry. Thus, slavery is an economic category of the greatest importance. Without slavery, North America, 
the most progressive of countries would be transformed into a patriarchal country. Wipe North America off the, off the map of the world and you will have anarchy. The complete decay of modern commerce and civilization. Cause slavery to disappear and you will have wiped America off the map of nations. This is Marx. And Marx is not a black nationalist. But I want to say, we have to, we, we say here, we have to note that here then is the historical materialist basis of African internationalism, which is again not simply an explanation of the conditions for Africans, it is an explanation of the world and the relations experienced by all of us in this world that has come to exist with the ascendancy of capitalism as a world economy. We have to note here as well that Marx's description of slavery as an economic category and his concept of primitive accumulation provide outstanding examples of historical objectification of African people by Europeans. The entire historical process that resulted in the total disruption and of the political economy of Africa, the imposition of colonial borders and the capture and dispersal of millions of Africans whose forced labor was responsible for the development of Europe and European society is characterized as an economic category. Marx reduced the process of European pillage and plunder of the world and the ensuing genocide and enslavement to quote unquote primitive accumulation of capital, a footnote whose function in history is to explain the development of Europe. So I just wanted to share this with you. Um, we say a lot more as you can imagine, and we talk about solutions, about what it takes to make revolution. And we talk about the centrality of the African revolution for that. We talk about how the, the, what the party, the African People's Socialist Party is doing now, is a modern version of what Mar Marcus Garvey uh, struggled to accomplish, uh, to actually uh, struggle to unite uh, and liberate African African people worldwide, a dispersed nation of people. And we, uh, this is not just a discussion. I mean, we exist uh, as a small party in this country, uh, in the African People's Socialist Party USA, but the African People's Socialist Party USA is a part of an African Socialist International, uh, an international party. That's why we say here, one people, because we are one people dispersed around the world as Africans. You can't get on the boat in Africa as an African in 1619 and then get off in Jamestown as a Negro. If we were Africans when we got on the boat, we were Africans when we got off the damn boat. You know, uh, uh, so we are one people. We say one party because we have to have a, a, a single organization such as what Garvey built, an international uh, organization that gives our struggle a strategic a character wherever it's been waged, whether it's waged in America, whether it's waged in Colombia, where we have organization, whether it's waged in the Bahamas, where we have organization, whether it's waged in Europe, uh, in England and, and Belgium and France, where we have organization, whether it's waged in, in East Africa, West Africa, and Southern Africa, where we, where we have organization, or Canada. It's, it's, we have to have a single organization, that's what, that's what Garvey was able to organize. We have a socialist international. So we say one people, one party, and we have a single destiny. And that is a destiny as a free people. That is to say that we have a responsibility to win our freedom, to win power over our own lives in association with all the other oppressed peoples in the world who are involved in the same struggle to overturn the verdicts of imperialism. Thank you. Uh -huh.